Hey everyone, this is the Nips and Sips podcast featuring me. I'm Dr. Jeremy Boyd and my partner in crime over there, Dr. Brandon Cruz. Uh, usually around this time of year, we're at uh, AOMP, so the American Academy of Orthopedic Man and Physical Therapists uh, Conference. Uh, it was supposed to be in, what, Cleveland or Ohio this year? Uh, con- conference that we love to go to uh, where with all the uh, big movers and shakers in the orthopedics, manual therapy, and sports physical therapy uh, meet up and nerd out. Uh, unfortunately, it had to be moved to virtual, as we all know, with everything going on with COVID. I was supposed to present a case study this year. Brands was doing your third part of your uh, yep. of your bring, series. Bringing the confidence back to manipulation. First, uh, first, or part one really was uh, spinal manipulation. That was actually Kyle, Dr. Kyle Feldman, who was a guest on the show. He he was. Uh, it was really his presentation. I just uh, was lucky enough to help him out. Uh, then last year, um, I guess there was more my presentation, but his uh, original idea um, that I used for a fellowship, and that was the upper Sorry. extremity, right? Bringing back the confidence to upper extremity. This year, we're doing lower extremity. Yeah, which is awesome. So. Virtual. Yeah, I was, a- I was able to attend that one, uh, the upper extremity. So I even learned some things. I was videoing most of it, but uh, yeah, looking forward to lower extremity as well, so um what nips are you doing appreciate it yeah, Jay, jay's always supporting me man gotta, gotta love it uh this this year we're gonna do a uh, long axis distraction uh some variations there how to do a short axis distraction especially if you're an undersized therapist uh and then maybe we might have to even add a couple more depending on how q and a are going uh but the, the staples are long axis short axis distraction a pro knee distraction manipulation or knee flexion manipulation uh sub tailor Subtalar uh, and cuboid, the cuboid whip. Nice. So nice. Uh, that will be the the five we're going with, and then obviously uh, we're going to show variations to to help different people out. Uh, so we end up doing a couple more there. So are you gonna have a live feed of like the people watching you, or yeah, do they yeah, just so have a feed of you? We had the call the other day. Um, uh, they put us through the platform. We log into everyone basically on a Zoom link, but we're going to be obviously presenters, so we get a couple additional privileges there. Um, Kyle will be in Virginia with the PowerPoint. I'll be here with the PowerPoint. Uh, we'll be able to share the screen, um, press pause, talk it out. I'll be in clinic, and Jeremy will be in his clinic, so we can actually show things on the fly. We're going to use our our interns that are with us to be our dummies, nice. which is for them because they get to now be exposed to a, a awesome course. Uh, awesome conference, which uh, if you haven't been ever a part of AOMP, please check it out. Um, I get no kickbacks or anything. Uh, it has changed my career. It's definitely changed your career. I definitely think it helps avoid burnout in clinicians. You're just around some of the brightest minds in the industry, um, You know, whether it's research, uh, business, sports, or orthopedics. Uh, you get to really geek out. Uh, and it really kind of will change and op- change your mindset, change your mind, and open you up to what else you're missing in therapy. So if you're if you do feel burnt out, if you feel like you're not getting answers, I mean, a conference like this really helps rejuvenate you and, and mm-hmm. get you back in a frame of mind of why why you did it. So spend that extra couple hundred bucks and uh, and do it. Yeah, definitely. I think I was there for an hour, uh, but. By the time I was there for an hour last year, I was like, yep, I need to go into a fellowship. And I already been through residency, double board certified, already had my practice. And uh, I've been around other clinicians that are like, yeah, at this point, you don't really need to do anything else or don't waste the money. But within an hour of just being around some of these amazing clinicians, I was like, nope, I got to I gotta get find a way to be on their level. And uh, it re- revitalized me and made me hungry. I was like, I got to learn more. So definitely an awesome, awesome experience. So uh, I think next year is in, is in Ohio there. And then the year yeah, after that is. I year couldn't tell the year after that. I know we missed IFOMP, which was going to be, we we're going to be in the Gold Coast there in Australia because uh, IFOMP's one side every four years, but we missed that one, unfortunately. Yeah, 2022, hopefully. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, so I guess. Uh, Guess to talk about my case study or what? Oh, oh we got to go over drinks, man. You're, you're, you're missing it. Yeah, me. I'm messing up, dude. I'm messing it. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been a little weird, a little weird week, especially uh, this is a, I know that our, our episodes get released a little bit. This is a presidential week here. Uh, election, mm-hmm. I should say. Anyway, I got Buffalo Trace. 
Uh, really good uh, scotch uh, or uh, bourbon whiskey, I should say. My, my apologies. Um, I like it. It's actually a little, little bit of uh, sweet taste at the end there. But, uh, Jared, what, what you have? I know you did a quick audible. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's Marta's beer is going to have to wait. Uh, Marta's uh, one of Brandon's PTs. She hooked me up with a big old bottle of something. But, yeah, this mm. is going to probably be a shorter episode. So, I flip it. Uh, I'm going to do uh, probably my favorite brewery that I've never actually been to, Amagang. I believe it is in Cooperstown, New York. Uh, the beer is uh, Three Philosophers. Uh, I've had it once before and I was a fan. But I uh, only have one left of it. I've been looking at this in my fridge for probably close to uh, again close to a year. Um, this is a gift from a client. And Look at that succulent pour. Jared, did you ever ten bar? Yeah, I should. I should have done that in college. No, this man. is my calling, and I oh, missed it. Um, and uh, yeah, for those uh, viewers at home, if you have never had it, uh, you got poured slowly. Uh, this is a uh this is i really forget which type of beer this is it's kind of a rich type of beer uh actually doesn't say uh a oh it's a quad it's a quad, quadruple beer ale sorry um so cheers to this look at this dark beautiful thing there you go That's good. 8.3. Very nice. 8.3 uh, uh, some of the steam, steam what? It's one of the higher. Steam theory. You gave me. Uh, this was in uh, Dallas, one of my newer ones. Um, we were mostly outside with that. Me and my wife, uh, I was on fellowship weekend. She showed up. Uh, they were great. They had like all kinds. It's more of like an arcade brewery. They had like. Uh, foosball and all these sort of things yeah and they yeah. gave out free decks of cards so i just mopped up on my wife playing gin but uh cool brewery um was my favorite in dallas but definitely a cool brewery if you have a chance to get there but all right so Jay, you, you were gonna have a a post approval well, you still are having a post it's, it's just virtual now so we figured we use the opportunity to see a, a very good interesting case jeremy has uh really to to get inside our thought process uh, we've had so many podcasts where we just kind of talk about the way you should be treating uh and how you know you should be going around but what does that really look like in real time especially you, you, you listen to our podcast or anybody's podcast really no matter what the topic is maybe you attend a course and you're like well i don't have time to do that in my clinic um it really comes down to, to discipline and, and you know trying one thing at a time and and implementing it and then you could see it slowly taking effect so we figured we use uh this opportunity being it's aomp week or, or weekend uh to give you some insight uh on jeremy's thought process uh and i i was lucky enough to to help him out um and kind of just talk over the case with him so i guess you could say our insight but it's, it's jeremy's case so I, i'm going to say his insight uh, but so Jerry, if you can just put and I guess leave up on the screen just so people could see it and we could talk over it. Uh, and we'll go with, uh, just, you know, the, the introduction of what the case was or what she came in presenting with, and then, you know, take us down your thought process. Yeah. So definitely a interesting case. Uh, and I like obviously these cases, um, Primarily one because direct access. So pretty much all my clients are 80, 90 percent are direct access. But I always tell my people everybody's a direct access. You always get a script from somebody unless it's immediately post op. Um, you know, it's it's up to you to make sure what they're coming in for is exactly what it is, or maybe it's not. And that's that unfortunately is a lot of the case. Uh, but we have the most time to kind of figure out what's really going on. So this particular case which was why I presented it is one uh, a novel intervention. So something that we don't know, it hasn't been documented in research. Someone else could have done it out there, but um, it was a com combination of just training uh, experience uh, and, you know, mentorship uh, all in one. Uh, and it provides some really great results. Um, case was a 43 year old, 
elite level competitive weightlifter. Uh, when I say elite level, at the national level for her uh, for her age uh, and weight class, obviously you have to take into respect to that. Uh, she's been having the issue for for two years and uh, since April, and that's another thing that I want to bring up is uh, this did require manual therapy. Obviously, it's at manual therapy uh, conference I'm presenting at. But a lot of there's a lot of talks that we shouldn't do manual therapy on chronic pain patients or people that have had it for a prolonged period of time. Or, you know, there's as you hear on our podcast that manual therapy, you know, people believe that you don't need to do it. Uh, well, this person went to traditional um, physical therapy and a couple other things, and symptoms were still present. But, um, Originally happened while weightlifting back in 2018. Uh, she had this kind of left quad hip pain. This would be her P1 or primary pain. Uh, she also on her body diagram put something this uh, towards her back on the one side and left glute, diagnosed with a glute spasm. Uh, so she, uh, she believed it was a leg issue. Uh, originally uh, did a lot of glute exercises, based off of probably the diagnosis. And I believe she received acupuncture slash dry needling. It helped, um, but it was still kind of there. And then kind of recently flared up on her. Uh, we saw her for one time a week for five weeks. And uh, where the big things, the magic happened was session three. Um, so, so Jay, you what, mind if I just interrupt you there? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so we, we had, you had this patient to, Two years of, of having some pain, yep. you eval her, they get this BS diagnosis of glute spasm, whatever that is. Um, you know, what what are you thinking? Where 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 is your head going of all right, where do I need to go with this examination? Mm -hmm. You know, do you start at the quad or the thigh? I see you have that red line around the left thigh. Did yeah. did you start at the glute or the piriformis where I, I think most people would go to and, and try and do mm -hmm. some you know, ischemic pressure or something, where are, um, you know, where, where are you thinking? What are you thinking at this moment in time? The back, right, right there. And then um, from training and, and mentorship, anytime something was reported, you guys, can you see my mouse? My yeah. mouse floating around? All right. That there is an issue in here, the back area, and it wasn't much. It wasn't even the primary thing that was reported. Mm -hmm. to report that you know you know you know some stiffness some pain but i lift weights and she's a coach uh at uh at her own olympic weightlifting gym so but my first thought process is here even if it was a glute spasm or issue i'm not thinking that glute spasm issue is going to cause anterior thigh pain uh so that was my big telltale sign of this is probably something coming more proximal. Uh, you hear on our podcast all the time, uh, the wiser, wiser I get, the more I start to look more towards here, upper extremity towards here. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that was first kind of line of, of process was I need to check out this area first. And that starts off in standing. I am, you know, assessing how they're moving, you know, bending at the back, extension, flexion, side bending, quadrant testing and those sort of things. So, um, and right there and then that's when we kind of discovered on the left, uh, UPA. So unilateral posterior to anterior, uh, spring testing was stiff there and resulted in, Ooh, I, oops. I forget to put hip there, left hip pain. Somebody's going to flag me on that for when it comes up for amped, but Oh, well, uh, it eliminated like that kind of hipish thighish pain that definitely made an impact on her on her pain down here so mm -hmm. i ran with it god i keep keep touching it but yeah so that was my process uh before what i've said that would have been the case if i was a earlier um you know younger clinician absolutely not i guarantee you if i if i got her years ago i would i may have gotten her to like 80 percent Probably if I was lucky, that's just natural healing. Yeah. Um, you know, of the, okay, glute spasm or, you know, there's definitely weaknesses in, uh, I don't want to touch it too, too much, but there's definitely some weaknesses in their left lower extremity for sure. 
and I will have tackled that. Um, man versus really looking at the source, which definitely now, felt like was here. Now, did she complain of numbness and tingling down that that thigh, or yeah, was it just pain? She she did. It was mostly pain that stopped her from um, mm. from lifting. She reported more of like this didn't quite feel right. Um, but it did kind of get like a, huh? Like tight or achy? Yeah, that was, that was kind of most of the way. She did report that kind of could, well, especially once we started playing around with things that she did report that it kind of felt kind of a fuzzy numbing sort of issue. All right. So, I remember. so just for our audience here, take away you playing with stuff. Mm -hmm. Did, is she complaining of fuzziness or anything like that? Or is it more achy? and tightness there, or maybe just fatigues easily on that left side. That was definitely the, that's what, what you report. I just want to highlight that because, you know, and I, I have students I take all the time as you, as do you, I have actually two um, newer grad PTs uh, that are employed at my office and uh, we have, you know, basically daily mentoring sessions and just being able to get inside their mind. And I shouldn't even say them, you know, we talk about it in our courses, we have, you know, PTs coming to our courses and, and bringing cases to it. And their mindset is, okay, soft tissue at the quad, or some type of release or cupping. And then yeah, some stretching to that quad because it's probably tight, and maybe some glute work, and some quad work. But you you decided to, all right, and, and stuff that we were taught in school, just do a, a lumbo pelvic screen and, and you went there. And I just want to emphasize that because you're going to, people are going to miss things if they don't treat the low back. So you went, you did some low back stuff, whether it's range of motion and spring testing. When you did your spring testing, that's when things started to unravel more so. And then you were able to make some, some connect some dots. So can you go into now how, when you did some UPAs and things like that, how some of those things, some of those onion peels started to peel back and you were able to connect some dots? Yep. And I'll also highlight that, you know, lumbar range of motion was within functional limits. I mean, it didn't, she wasn't terribly limited or reproduced some things. So some people that, that warrants them to be like, Oh, it must not be from the back. It must be a leg issue. Um, again, she was previously treated in the leg as well. Uh, but one understand, like, listen, if that person's coming back to me, coming back, uh, she was seen previously elsewhere. Um, and didn't get results from that, that means one, that must be something, something's missing. Um, but then, you know, once, all right, yeah, check out lumbar active range motion, nothing came to be, I need to do a, a little bit more thorough of an exam. Mm -hmm. And so went in, started doing UPAs and started to get into that area. And you gotta think this is someone who lifts hundreds of pounds overhead. Um, as we kind of talked about before on the podcast, you know, adding some real load. It's not like, oh, okay, good, great. I've seen that way too many times with just a quick assessment. Oh, do you feel anything? No. Or stiffness is blown off um, or whatever it may be. I have put some load into it. Um, you know, I'm 190, probably at the time it was probably 200 pounds. Uh, um, and really push into it. And right there and then at first, from what I remember, reproduced things um, and then working on it. So that was like ding, ding, ding um, on that left side. Always, uh, not so much on the right, uh, but definitely on the left side. Uh, it was like boom, boom. And I was like, all right, let me work this for a little bit. Um, and then as we were there for a little bit, symptoms started to, to decrease uh, from it went spiking up and then it went better than baseline. So right there and then I was like, all right, we already know this is the problem site. Uh, and then understanding the, the, how the weightlifter moves and those sort of things. And uh, especially with like snatches and those sort of things, a lot of, a lot of stresses go into that thoracolumbar area. Um, mm -hmm. We discussed that in previous podcasts as well. But so that was, that was a telltale sign. I was like, all right, I just need to focus on this area. I asked her, did anybody work on this area before? And there wasn't anybody, so it just makes sense. Um, you know, you know, glutes are going to get strengthened with Olympic lifting, uh, for sure. You know, hip flexors, all these sort of things. So uh, yeah. something was prohibiting those muscles from firing efficiently. 
So it had to be the lumbar spine, the thoracic so, lumbar. Quite quick uh, follow-up question here. And I just want to say, if you hear a horn in the background, it's my town. They send off this stupid alarm every day. It's fucking annoying. So I apologize. <laughs> I try to mute you. Or not mute you, but mute my area. So I want to talk about, you did P to A's, and they had an increase in pain. Most people are stopping. They're like, you know, for whatever reason, a therapist doesn't want to cause more pain, and they'll stop. You and I both know, okay, let's, let's um, do this another 15, 30 seconds. Let's see if it comes back down. And you, and you made that bell-shaped curve there. What, can, can you go into that? Like, why, why do you staying with that even though it hurts the patient? What's your mindset with that? Um, you know, just for the audience, you know, I, you mentioned P1 and P2 earlier. Maybe it has to do with something like that. Take off from there. Yeah, why I'm sticking with it, one – um, patient buy-in. Now I've hit something completely unrelated to the area that they perceive is going on and I re reproduce something. Uh, but not just to be a dick and like, all right, let's keep reproducing and make them really pissed off and then have them leave. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, just to roll into treatment right there and then, maybe it's a protective mechanism at first of you hitting that sensitized area or that area where the brain perceives as vulnerable or damaged or whatever it may perceive. And wow, I hit it. And it's like, no, 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 don't come anywhere near that area. Send the signals, make them stop. Uh, but if I go in and grade my mobilizations or change it up, and I probably I play around with a thing where I'll start off on the right side. If like the left side's reproducing things, I'll play around with the right side just to get some sort of descending inhibition or neurophysiological effect in the general area and then kind of start gravitating towards my left side i play around with that i'm pretty sure that's what happened in during this case um and then that's it like my assessment now has became a treatment right there and then and i'm midway through my assessment and they're starting to feel things get better right there so right there within probably two minutes i've gotten that patient sold in the clinic, they're gonna do whatever I tell them to do, and gonna stick it out. Um, and then again, that kind of perception of now I'm connecting that, I would say that was honestly her P3, or, or tertiary pain, um, you know, up in that back, but I linked that P3 to that P1 and two. Um, yeah. And then the, you know, now the patient needs to understand, well, all right, now I get why me trying to do a million glute and left hip strengthening exercises and getting needles driven into my leg did not do anything. I need to focus on here and this guy's figured it out. So yeah. that's kind of my process and those sort of things. And, you know, this open up where things now are less painful. And now I can, if I feel the need to strengthen that left hip, which is essentially what I did in the initial evaluation. Yeah. So that's kind of my mindset with, with that going on. Awesome stuff. I just want to add to that too. With that, um, we're, you know, Jeremy was able to reproduce the person's pain. Don't run away from that. Like, especially when it's musculoskeletal. And if, it, you know, if you're worried about red flags and stuff like that, if you're able to reproduce someone's pain, that's, that's gold to me. Cause now I, I you know, we're able to be like, okay, if I could reproduce it, I could probably calm it down too. Um, so now, you know, with that said, Jeremy said that kind of pretty much brings us to, to session three. He's done some P to A's. He got recreation of pain down that left leg. What made you choose some lateral femoral cutaneous nerve glides? I mean, you didn't even do femoral, maybe you did, but what made you now think, all right, let me do neurodynamics. And then mm -hmm. within neurodynamics, you went and chose that one, which is probably not on most people's radar. I mean, most mm -hmm. people forget about femoral nerve glides, let alone lateral femoral. So if you could just kind of take us, you know, what cued you into, let me give this a shot. Yeah. Uh, so I just came back from my fellowship weekend and we reviewed, um, most people know femoral nerve glides is Eli's test, which is you're prone and bend the knee and maybe lift the hip a little bit. Uh, we went and reviewed a sideline version um, 
which you know may have came to me during residency or other sort of things, but it kind of got slipped to the back of my brain and those sort of things. So we went over that and it's like, you know what, this is, you know, her symptoms are down into the leg. It's starting to add up and all these sort of things. Let me do it this way. But, you know, understanding anatomy and how the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, I mean, I didn't do it as much justice with how I drew things here because I was doing this on PowerPoint and just every time I drew that shape, just swiped the wrong way. So this was the best one. This is the best swipe of 12 attempts. I was like, like this, I'm done. Uh, if someone wants to go, but it was definitely more towards the, the lateral compartment. Mm -hmm. um, and just where I was and understanding anatomy, um, I was just like, okay, let me, and I'll be honest, I went from femoral, which definitely she's like, I'm starting to feel things with that. Mm -hmm. went to Opterator, which you mentioned to me previously um, for a different case study. Mm -hmm. um, even though she didn't present with more inside pain, but while I'm there, uh, I might as well you know, give it a go. And then I dropped right into a lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, um, which sounded more like her symptoms because her symptoms were more towards the kind of outside of the thigh. And that lit her up like a Christmas tree. Okay. Um, so that was just kind of my thought process with that. Um, it was just brought up again. We were making improvements with the techniques we were doing. Uh, and you know, could have wrote it out, it may have, may have been enough. Uh, but my, I, you, and I, and you know, other clinicians you know, who we've had on the show is we have an addiction to get people better faster, uh, as quickly as they can. So we'll keep playing around with things. Um, and that's when it starts to become. Uh, if you read the backgrounds, maybe this was a double crush syndrome. You know, maybe it's some irritation to that lateral femoral cutaneous nerve and something more proximally towards the nerve root itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's when it was, all right, maybe it's, you know, we have something that reproduce things with our UPA assessment proximally at the spine itself. And we also have something that really litter up during, um, our femoral nerve testing or lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Why not uh, do them both? Uh, and we got in residency uh, talking about cervical lateral glides or distraction techniques um, with, um, with neural right. dynamics. And I've, I tested it out. It's been very effective. We've discussed that. I played around with it with some sciatica, lumbar radiculopathies. Um, I've had some huge, uh, huge improvements with that not as much research into the lumbar spine which why it makes this a novel case study so i played around with things uh i went just doing lateral femoral cutaneous glides just just trying to you know get the nerve moving i figure it might as well be as specific as i can if lateral femoral cutaneous nerve was definitely the the ticket do that versus just femoral nerve mm -hmm. um and you know, combine what was previously beneficial, the left UPA, with that. So I was just mobilizing that um, while we were moving it into a lateral femoral cutaneous nerve uh, glide. But yeah. the the real ticket was gapping her um, while doing the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. And I was just listening to the patient. Was she said that that one was that one completely abolished all all her symptoms. So that's kind of what happened between third and fourth session was, all right, then I'm just going to do that technique. Uh, so just, you know, listening to the patient, understanding anatomy, that kind of is how everything kind of developed into creating this little, we have a video of it, but that's me gapping. Well, this is me resting, looking out into the, into the town oh, or I something. Yeah. <laughs> Just Maybe kind of, that girl running in that fountain like you always. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We have. <laughs> Maybe something was, was going on. Crazy things yeah. happen in the college, college town. Uh, college towns. We had like the triple walk of shame that we had during our course. Uh, yeah, that was great. So uh, we we had that nice showing in that, at Glassboro. But you it know this. Saturday morning. Yeah. This is me gapping. Uh, Jamie Parent was my student at the time. Uh, she's performing that lateral femoral cutaneous nerve uh, glide uh, more distally. 
uh, where she's you know bringing the hip into extension, knee is bent, um, and dropping into adduction. Um, that's what really kind of biases that lateral femoral continuous nerve. And now learning more and those sort of things probably have changed up the position of Jamie. Uh, mm-hmm. So she kind of biased more of the ankle and the knee, and mm-hmm. more knee flexion, uh, plantar flexion, dorsiflexion. Um, but, you know, maybe that will figure out things in just one session. So that's, that's, the, that's the fun of doing these sort of things and even trying to figure out uh, novel techniques is yeah cool great you got a case study uh did something novel but how could i've made that even better how could i've done this maybe even cleared out and well figured this out in session one so what i figured out in session three and how could i've made it even better could i've made that that technique even more improved by cleaning up things here by adding that knee flexion or potentially dorsiflexion plantar flexion component so um, yeah. yeah that's kind of the story of session three and on this was a awesome case year um i can't believe it's it's not even really been a full year um since you implemented it, it feel if it just feels longer uh i wanted to ask or i wanted to point out before i asked you know what you did was great and, and more clinicians need to start thinking outside the box like you did like you took something that has been studied and in the knee articles, he discusses cervical glides with uh, a median nerve glide, right? Combining neurodynamics. Sounds this sad. hasn't been done in research yet, but you took what has been done, mm-hmm. took the theory, the concept, extrapolated it, and did it to a different region. Our profession, especially the newer grads, and, and probably I would say the last, what, um, where we've been out seven years. So let's say zero to eight years everyone's so bent hell bent on evidence-based 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 means the research if an article hasn't been written about it we can't do it that's not evidence-based no something has been studied in a different body part or different region you took that concept that strategy that thought extrapolated it applied it to a different region that's as much evidence-based as anything else you know people just need to take a, a step back and think more try things out test mm-hmm. retest you know if we can get a message across which we talk about every everything another thing this is a two-man job here sure mm-hmm. could you have probably get a rig you know drop that patient's leg down into extension a deduction and, and taking like a super band and wrapped it around her ankle or her shin and tied it down to the table you probably could have done that mm-hmm. this is a two-man job here grab another clinician and i think now i never used to be this way but i think I think every PT should have a student there, you know, you, you, they say, Oh, it's, it's much work, yada, yada, yada. I'd say for the most part, it's not, you know, it takes a couple of weeks to train them, but after that you have them and they're an extra set of hands around the clinic. They're going to make your life easier. And if you mm-hmm. want them to be good, you have to be good and train them good, train them well, whatever the proper grammar is on that English. So, you know, if, if you're like, I can't do that, I don't have an intern or, or you know, extra set of hands, well, go get one. You know, use an aid of tech, sign a contract with a local school and get some interns in there to help you out. Um, that's going to force you to level up as a clinician and, and know what you're talking about and not just pass on some BS that you've been doing for, for you know, eight years um, because it's, it's worked in, in your experience. Um, Jay. Any manipulations done on this patient? We, we've gone through a whole podcast, Manips and Sips, and not talking about manipulations. It's been no. mobilizations and neurodynamics, which yeah. is perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got, you know, in five sessions, which is better than most, you got, you know, this patient discharged and pain-free after two years. So I just want to point out there, it doesn't have to be manipulations as much as Jeremy and I talk about manipulations and I have to. I will say... You want to know how to get that patient better faster. Maybe if you manipulated them, you could have gotten a little better. better. I'm, just, I'm just teasing. I'm just throwing it out there. No, but, no. And I, that's, that's what I just alluded to before is like, yeah, this is great. Five sessions, new technique was a home run hit, multiple year patient pain. But it's like, great, cool. And most people are like, oh, that's a win. Uh, but it's like, I look at this and like, fuck me for not even testing this stuff till session three. Uh, four is where I really hit like the, oh, I know what's a technique that's really going to do the work. Um, 
there was a reason why I kind of did not do, because I love that thoracolumbar junction manipulation in, in uh, seated and those sort of things. Um, I just did not implement it. Maybe I think maybe just, just wasn't a huge fan of it. They, not me as a clinician. I'm a huge fan of that one. Um, so I kind of steered away from it. But ideally, that probably would have been, you know, the ticket, uh, you know, is, you know, really, I mean, I know there's, you know, conflicting evidence and those sort of things, but um, me playing, with, especially with neural dynamics and those sort of things, and I'll do the combined joint mobilizations and I do test three tests, but like, let's say for the cervical spine, I'll get them there. Ow, ow, ow. And then I'll like, all right, let me just do uh, a cervical manipulation. Mm-hmm. And now they gained, you know, 10, 20 more degrees of elbow extension and wrist, those sort of things. So I see that and it's like, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's definitely an impact of your manipulations more so than your joint mobs on especially, you know, because neural dynamics or neural flexibility or mobility, if you want to per se say that. So yeah, in the, I think there, there was a reason because I generally kind of think more towards manipulations where I did not implement that for this case. Um, but, uh, yeah, if it was, it was all up to me, um, I probably would have, and I would have wish that I could have cut that down to like one to two sessions, maybe three at the most. I mean, I mean, if you think about it, you know, once you hit session three and like you said, four, it was only a couple of sessions. I mean, you yeah. picked it up if, if you're saying you really didn't hit the ground running until session three or four, you really did it in, in, you know, two or three sessions there. And, mm. and maybe that the first couple of sessions were, yeah, evaluation, feeling the patient out, them giving you more information over time. So, you know, don't beat yourself up. This is a great case, Jared. Thanks for, thanks for sharing it. Uh, don't want to make it too long here. Uh, unless you have anything else to add, I don't want to cut you off either. No, no, no. Um, um, all is good. Patient did great. She's a uh, six month follow up, it completely asymptomatic. So, awesome. well, lasted. Uh, so that yeah, that's another big thing. It's like oh, um, I forget what schmuck said it, but it was just like oh, male therapy only works on people short term of people that would naturally get better. Yeah. This is a two year old client, and you know, six month follow up, clearly significant different outcomes. Uh, so, and exercise was previously just traveling, and there was dry needling, but yeah, um, so. I won't say that schmuck's name, but what? <laughs> great, great stuff there. Uh, as we wrap up, I do want to say before before I forget here, um, kind of transitioning away from this, uh, Jeremy did uh, looked at you know where we are in the podcast rankings, and we're breaching the top fifty, which I think is awesome. Didn't realize we were getting there. Uh, I want to, and on behalf of Jeremy and myself, thank our audience. We obviously wouldn't have gotten here without you guys. Uh, thanks for the continual listening. Uh, please, actually, you know, can, can we get to the top five? Um, we'd love to do that. Uh, can't do that unless you guys tell your friends about us, tell your colleagues, uh, coworkers, things like that uh, about us. Uh, we're on what uh, Spotify, iTunes, um, SoundCloud, SoundCloud uh, like all, Google, all the big, all the big ones. ones. Uh, you can find us there. We're actually uh, on YouTube now. Uh, so you can see the, the whole thing. Um, uh, you know, we have the Jeremy's case today and in previous episodes, we, we put up articles for you guys to see. So you can find us on YouTube. Uh, bear with us. We're, we're still trying to upload some of the original podcasts, the first probably 20 that were just audio. Uh, so we're, we're uploading that, but all the more recent ones from probably about what, 25 on or, or on. Mm-hmm. So uh, again, just want to thank our, our audience um for their continued support glad you guys are liking it uh keep uh keep i guess listening out we're, we're going to be uh putting some more things out uh you know just via email notifications or, or newsletters just to kind of keep everybody in the loop of what's going on and uh yeah that's uh i guess that's it on uh, my and jerry would, anything else no, no, I agree. Thank you guys so much for listening in. I mean, the big thing you can do is make sure you subscribe to us, uh, you know, versus uh, you know, a lot of times you're just waiting for it to be posted and those sort of things. Subscri- subscribe to us. I usually put them out in the morning. Uh, that way you can catch it on the way to work, uh, especially these shorter episodes. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, you let us know if there's anything you want to 
listen to uh, next week is the, your is the next episode is uh, a one that was recommended by a listener of ours about the history of manual therapy. Uh, so yeah, if you're something that you're interested in or struggling with and you want us to talk about it, um, have our thoughts on it, we're more than happy to do that. Um, we, we love that sort of stuff. Um, and then, you know, we're going to do the research and then put our own clinical experiences in. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Keep chiming in and, uh, thanks for listening to us. And, uh, we're at nips and sips on all major, uh, social media platforms. Uh, I'm at the decent doctor and at traffic, the therapeutics Brandon's at think like a fellow and at pursue PT now, uh, any other sort of things that we do have our, uh, of course, uh, spinal manipulations coming up at, uh, at Brandon's place in Verona, New Jersey on December 5th and 6th. Yep, correct. So, and, uh, yeah. Um, we also have our, our manual therapy mentorship, which isn't only manual therapy, really just trying to uh, teach clinicians how to, how to think differently, how to think outside the box, uh, challenge the status quo. Uh, we will be, you know, if you like today's episode here and dived into, you know, more thought process and things, that's what our mentorship is really about. Uh, so check that out uh, on the website, uh, Pursue PT Now, and then it's under the education tab and manual therapy mentorship tab. So uh, check us out there, guys, and uh, until the next one. All right. Cheers, everyone.